Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. Definitely the whole experience, you know, getting away from the, the everyday hustle and bustle of going to work, leaving the job behind. It feels good to get away and just experience nature. We're gonna pull these out of the oil, take them right to this paper towel to drain. It's jingling. It sure is. <laughs> Some of these objects that are found here, it's the first time someone's seen them for 100, over 130 years. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks, Guts, Glory, Ram. It's going that way first, and are oh, you shooting a different one now? Yeah. Okay. Pull. Uh oh. Wow, it's been a while. Not what we want on the hunting channel. <laughs> the opening of dove season in Texas is just a few hours away, and James Montgomery is getting in a little shooting practice. You haven't shot a gun in two years, so I got to knock the rust off here. Cool. Okay, cool. There we go. I think I hit about maybe 5%, but I hit my last shot, so I'm going in tomorrow good. So it's going to be a good day. This is James Montgomery, Austin resident, businessman, family man, father, coach, dove hunter. Definitely the whole experience, you know, getting away from the, the everyday hustle and bustle of going to work, leaving the job behind, leaving soccer practice, you know, <laughs> behind. It feels good to get away and just experience nature. So they're scared of me now. James didn't grow up in a hunting family, so he came to hunting in a roundabout way. You know, I grew up playing soccer and football, missed out on Boy Scouts, never got involved in the outdoors. Didn't find hunting until in my mid-20s or so. That's when a friend invited James to go dove hunting. And I think I bagged maybe two birds. Yeah, I got a sore shoulder and a great experience out of the deal. Ever since then, I've been hooked. The great thing about dove hunting is you don't need to grow up in it. Um, as far as having a place to go, uh, there's a lot of public opportunities available for dove hunting that Texas Parks and Wildlife provide. There's right at a million acres of public hunting land available through the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department's annual public hunting permit program. What about the water? We got a little bit of water over here. That land includes wildlife management areas, state parks, and land leased from private landowners and companies. For the most part, you just need some shells and a shotgun and a hunting license, and you can be good to go and have a great opportunity to get in the outdoors and uh, get an experience and get the introduction to, to hunting in Texas. Yes, good boy. Good boy. Hey James, let's work this pole a little bit, buddy. Mom, I saw one! While James didn't discover the outdoors until he was in his 20s, he's starting his kids out early, hoping to instill in them at a young age a love for nature. Why is it heavy? Why is it heavy? Well, because they're tugging on you. So my kids are four and six years old, and I, I believe that they're, they're a little young for hunting. Hold it up, buddy. I think fishing is probably one of the best ways to introduce the kids outdoors because it's a safe sport and it, it helps them appreciate nature. It's an ah! What was that? You're all right. Watch your, watch your bobber. Well, more than anything, I want another reason to go out and hang out with my boys as much as possible. There you go. There's too many gadgets and devices that keep our attention and keep us focused on being inside of the house. Put it down on the bed. I want another reason to come outside and enjoy nature. Want to see a twerking video real quick? <laughs>
For James, this hunting season starts inside on his iPad. I am purchasing my hunting license online. Combination hunting and fishing, super combo. Beats going to the store, especially we don't have time to go down there and stand in line. Well done. That was easy. The opening day of dove season finally arrives. James is ready. He's got his license, he's had some practice, and he's got a case of shells. A case? You know, I'm planning on shooting a lot of birds. Or missing a lot of birds, <laughs> one of the two. <laughs> Go! The opening day hunt was, it was a little rough for me. I missed the previous year. It was almost like it was my first hunt. Shot out a bunch. I missed quite a few birds. A long shot. But yeah, we had a good time. This right, we're gonna be grilling hamburger. James is hunting with friends on the Bird Family Ranch in Fife, Texas. Brian Franca is the leaseholder. He's been hunting here for about five years. I got wings here, so. On opening day, you know, people were all around the field. There were probably 15 or 20 of us. Woo! I thought I picked the wrong spot. I thought they put me there for a reason. <laughs> I was like, that, this is why they put me here, because the birds don't fly this way. Across the field, you can hear gunshots after gunshots. Like, wow, we gotta move around. Eventually, you know, the wind shifted and, uh, and the birds started coming my way. Oh, wow. We got a lot more exciting really quickly. Good shot, go! That, that makes it all worth it right there. Did we each get one out of that group? Yeah. Dove hunting has always been a family affair for Brian. He's brought along his son, Ty. I don't go hunting without him. Son? As well as his dad. <sighs> don't you go out there and take my bird. <laughs> Brian's dad is great to have out there when you're hunting. He is everybody's spotter. Hey, go over your left shoulder. Over your left shoulder. When he sees a bird, Hi. he's going to let you know Coming it. between your mind. He's going to call your name. You're going to hear him. Jimbo, Jimbo. Brian, Brian, Brian. Justin, Justin. Even through your ear protection. James, straight at you. He got one. <laughs> He's great to have around, and it just makes it that much more fun. Right there, Ty. Right there. Ty's 10 years old. You know, I'm, I'm three times his age at least, and he was, he was making me look bad out there. Good shot, Ty. Initially, I was trying to put the beat right on the bird. And um, you have to realize these things are fast, so you have to lead the bird, as, as Ty pointed out. You gotta shoot a little in front of it. You gotta leave your ego in the car when you go hunting and just take all the coaching you can get. It was slow at first, and it, it picked up. It made, it made it all worth it. Just gotta have a little patience. Brian, how many you got? A lot. <laughs> Brian realizes that he has probably 10 times more experience than I do at this. Take him, James. He'll let some birds fly by him to help me out. Take him. To make sure that we're all having a good time. There you go, James. Woo! The good news is that I didn't limit out this morning, so I got to come out again to shoot some more. <laughs> I got four birds in the bag, and you're having a good time, so I'm not at work. <laughs> it's going great. I didn't grow up in the hunting family, but I'm glad I found it. I cannot wait to take James and Noah out hunting, fishing and camping and all the things that I experienced late in life. I want to start super early with them, just doing fun things and connecting and, and having some good quality time together. Now, about that case of shells he needed for opening day. Maybe one box of shells left. Hey, it's great for the economy. Keep an academy in business. That last one was a tough shot. It's a coin flip on who got it near you. I was pretty sure that one was mine. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I felt it. We'll flip a coin. All right. Okay. <laughs> Hi, this is Jeff Martinez with El Chile Cafe and Cantina in Austin, Texas. Today we're going to be doing some wild game cooking. We're using dove today. It's a lean, 
tender dark meat. We're making a buffalo dove breast with a celery and carrot salad and a blue cheese dressing. Let's get started. We're gonna take our dove breast, we're gonna dredge it in the flour. Make sure you coat them all over. This flour is gonna help the buttermilk stick to the dove breast. Here's the buttermilk right here, right in there. Make sure they're coated all over with buttermilk. And then right back into the flour. The buttermilk's gonna help the flour stick to the dove breast. Make sure they're evenly coated with the flour, just like so. All right, then we're gonna go straight into the oil. You want your oil to be at 375 degrees. That'll give you a nice brown, crusty coating on the outside while cooking the dove through. While those are cooking, we're gonna go ahead and make our salad. So we've got some celery, some shaved carrots, a little bit of red onion, and I like to use all of the vegetables, so I've got some celery leaves here from the top and some buttermilk dressing to finish it off. Toss that around. Make sure you coat all the vegetables with the dressing. And that buttermilk dressing will take away some of the bite of the buffalo sauce. All right, there we go. Let's check our dove breasts. We're gonna pull these out of the oil, take them right to this paper towel to drain. So this dove recipe reminds me a lot of when I was younger. My pop would take me dove hunting right outside of San Antonio at the family ranch. After the hunt, we'd all sit around and kind of tell stories and stuff. And I always had something to look forward to every year. That was dove season. Take them. To get more information on dove hunting, check out Texas Parks and Wildlife's website. So these dub breasts look like they're ready to go. I've got my homemade buffalo sauce here. It's a mix of sriracha, butter, vinegar, a little Worcestershire sauce. I'm gonna throw these right in. I'm gonna mix them up, make sure I coat them evenly, and I'm gonna go ahead and put them on top of the salad. And then I'm gonna finish it all off with a little blue cheese. So this is a new twist on an old favorite, buffalo wings, and it's also a great way to end your dove hunt. Buen provecho, y'all. Welcome to the Big Bend. When people first come out here, they look at the harshness of the desert and think, how could anybody survive out here? But if you look closer at the plants and the diversity out here, you'd realize that everything we need is right here all around us. So let's go take a look at what we have out here and how we could survive off the land. This is creosote. This is probably one of the most common shrubs in the Chihuahuan Desert. It smells like the wood preservative you put on railroad ties and on uh, telephone poles. It's also excellent for your stomach and all your internal organs as long as you don't do too much of it. One of our rangers, whenever he had a stomach ache, his mother would feed him creosote tea. He'd rather go to school with a stomach ache than have to stay at home and drink his mother's creosote tea all day long. Here's one of my favorite cactus. This is the strawberry pitaya. Every spring, it's covered with purple magenta blooms. Then right after that, it starts putting on fruit. When the fruit is ripe, it's a race between javelinas and humans to see who's gonna collect the most of it. This is the Okatia. It's probably uh, known as one of the icons of the Chihuahuan Desert. The Okatia will bloom in the springtime and you can take those flowers and make a tea out of it. It tastes a lot like hibiscus flower tea. A lot of the crowls out here are made out of Okatia stalks. Don't even have to use your uh, barbed wire. It carries its own barbs on it. So tall probably one of the most versatile plants in all the Chihuahuan Desert. Just about everything on this plant can be used. You can have these wonderful green straps. You can weave them together for floor mats or bedding mats as cordage for anything you might need to tie together. Uh, these will work. Then what you're left with is the heart of the solto. It's the heart of the solto we can eat. You dig a pit, line the pit with rock, Build a fire inside the pit and let it burn down the coals. Throw the soltol heart on top of these coals. The next morning, you take your machete and you split it open in the middle. And then you take the tender leaves that are on the inside and you scrape the meat off between your teeth like you would be eating an artichoke. And you'd be surprised how sweet it is. The 
tastes a lot like a cabbage has been cooked in brown sugar. The desert seems to be a harsh environment, but as you can tell, the desert is full of life. So come visit us here at Big Bend Ranch State Park. Yeehaw! To our people, Polidero Canyon is a very sacred place. There is a spirit there. Palo Duro Canyon is indeed sacred. A historic battle took place within this canyon. The last major battle of the Red River War. The final stand before Kiowa, Comanche, and Southern Cheyenne Indians were forced onto reservations. This looks like this is probably a piece of tin. It's thin. Yeah. yeah. And now tribal elders have teamed up with archaeologists to try to uncover the secrets of a 130-year-old battle. A chance to return the spirit of the Southern Plains Indians back to Palo Duro Canyon. For as long as this canyon has been a state park, Palo Duro has lured campers, hikers, and mountain bikers. But now it's attracting archaeologists. They're here to explore this new addition to the park, close to 8,000 acres of untouched history. We're very excited at Paladur Canyon, not only because it adds to the beauty of the park itself, but it's historically significant because it was the final battle in the Red River Wars, the Battle of Paladur Canyon. Quiet in the rank. Back on September 28, 1874, the U.S. Cavalry, under the command of Colonel Ranald McKenzie, snuck down into the canyon with plans to ambush several Indian tribes that were settling into Palo Duro for the coming winter. McKenzie made the decision to launch a surprise early morning attack to catch the Indians completely off guard. Yeah! Charge! McKenzie was successful in getting his troops down into the canyon, caught the Indians completely by surprise. Come on. And it turned out to be a rout on the part of the army against the Indians. And it was the turning point that finally forced those Indians, made them realize we have no choice. We can't stay out here on the plains without food and without transportation. And they began drifting back to the reservations. You listen to the stories and you look around and you think, how did they? How did our people ever get out of here? Now, over 130 years later, descendants of those Kiowa and Comanche Indian tribes have returned to the battle site, to this new piece of public land. Here to pay their respects, <coughs> and to help parks and wildlife archeologists unearth some answers. A lot of the elders who may have known certain aspects of a certain accounts, historical accounts, that they don't, they're not here with us anymore. They've, uh, they've gone on. Well, see, they came down on the village here. So it's important for our children, our young people, to understand where we came from, why we are here, why we are Comanche, and how we are going to be Comanche. Yeah, it's a nail. What we're trying to do here is to bring in both the Native American perspective and to collect data that can add detail and scope to the overall story. The jingle. The jingle. It sure is. <laughs> handmade. See? It is, look. And then it's here. It's a cone, the bottom of a dress. Or it'd be sewn onto a moccasin, and it makes a beautiful tinny sound. The ultimate goal is to follow geographically the route of the battle as it progressed through the canyon. When you come to a site... There's three rocks right there, look. There is a spirit there, and that spirit is what kind of draws you, and you kind of get a sense, a feeling. James Coverdale relies on his Kiowa heritage when he searches sacred sites. Some of these objects that are found here, it's the first time someone's seen them for 100, over 130 years, and to actually find an object that may have been, you know, from my great-great-great-grandfather. That's what I think about when I find something. 
most of the artifacts left behind were made of metal, so those metal detectorists look and listen. Okay, that means there's something down in there. We don't know what it is. It's in that clod somewhere. So it's in here, if I didn't drop it. There it is. It's just a piece of tin, I believe, and they've been chiseling on it to make their air points out of. As the metal detector survey progresses and people locate items, those items are removed from the ground, placed in plastic bags, and pin flagged in place. This is artifact 34, piece of crimped metal. A later crew will then follow with GPS mapping equipment. And plot it. Once we bring them into the lab and get them cleaned up, washed up, then they go through a chemical bath, essentially, that will stop that corrosion process. Les Eason is a curator in training. And probably the most important thing is to make sure you don't get any scratches on the artifacts. You don't want to compromise the artifact at all. They've already been through quite a bit. We use soft tools like the toothpick, um, just so it's not really abrasive or anything. It's kind of neat to think that this was worn by somebody 130 years ago and uh, what it might have meant to them uh, as a decorative piece. It's just nice to see the work in its final stage. Let's see what we got. Once stabilized, the true inspection is underway. Then we're at the point where we can actually begin the analysis of them and uh, study some of the details. We think this piece may be a handmade, an Indian-made horse bit. Close to 1,000 artifacts have been unearthed and cataloged. This is the 45 caliber Springfield cartridge and the 45 caliber bullet that would have been with the cartridge. Uh, this was the cartridge and bullet that was being used by the Army in 1874. This is a 50 caliber musket ball that we recovered from the battle site, and it's clear evidence that the Indians were using whatever firearm type that they could get their hands on. Other domestic type items that we found there included axe heads that the Indians were using. This item is typically referred to as a food grater. Uh, they punched a lot of holes all through it. Uh, this is a naja, naja being a Navajo term that means pendant. This piece would have been made by the silversmiths in New Mexico and then traded to the Indians for them to wear as a pendant. Yeah, you're getting some good results there. After months of study, those GPS computer graphs of recovered artifacts begin to provide some answers. You can see that the natives are continuing on up and out of the canyon here and here. But there are still areas that archaeologists need to search, unknown details yet to be discovered, all in hopes of being able to tell the true tale of the battle at Palo Duro. We have the opportunity to look at the pieces of the puzzle as they were dropped 130 years ago. It's now our task and our challenge to start putting those pieces back together into a way that tells us the whole story. We really need to give our Comanche children a sense of the history, a sense of the power, so it goes on into the future. If we don't do that today, the people who died here died for nothing. Let Passport to Texas be your guide. Listen to the weekday radio series and encounter fascinating wildlife. Explore the diversity of our parks and historic sites. Enjoy the country's best hunting and fishing. Visit PassportToTexas.org to find a station near you. And remember, life's better outside.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.